My name is Tony Ibanez. I'm a solution architect for the federal team at OSEANT. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about OSEANT's hyperscale data analytics solution that can support the modern warfighter. So OSEANT is a data warehouse company. And the reason why we were founded is to handle, help organizations handle the volume of data that they're now being faced with. And you may think that your data challenges aren't quite so large that they're, that they're impossible to manage today. But the important thing to understand is that, you know, the devices that generate data are increasing in quantity and in resolution. We're seeing this across multiple industries. In ad tech, for example, you know, 10 million digital ad placement auctions are occurring every second. That generates about 26 petabytes of data per day for the companies that make our websites run. On the network side, 15 petabytes of metadata per telco per year are being generated. Connected vehicles. Connected vehicles can generate 500 megabytes of, vehicle, uh, of data per day. And then mobile phones, right? You know, the call detail records that are associated with mobile phones have a wealth of information, but it's very, very large in volume. All of this has to go somewhere. And then against that backdrop, right, you know, organizations within the Department of Defense have this mandate to, you know, maintain data and make it widely available, which means the data has to be held on to, curated, and managed as a product. There are challenges with that when the data gets to the to this level of scale that we saw previously. The existing solutions that analyze that data are complex and they become increasingly so when they get to that level of scale. And so that results in siloing, which results in more complexity as well. Uh, new, new applications can take a long time to bring to market for this reason. And then uh, on top of that, the continuous analysis at scale, or rather the inability of existing solutions to analyze this data at scale, stifles innovation. It means that we're not doing as much with this data as we could. Against this backdrop is where OSEAN comes from. We were founded in 2016, and we emerged from stealth mode uh, in the spring of last year. And what we are at the end of the day is a software company that, that makes a data warehouse product. We call it the OSEAN Hyperscale Data Warehouse. So as we said before, we focus on hyperscale database data analysis challenges. In our world, we use hyperscale to, think, to, to refer to data sets that are trillions, possibly even quadrillions of rows. Data that's constantly being ingested, constantly being queried, where you, know, you might have to take you know, multi-hundred terabyte or petabyte level database tables and merge them together. That's a very, very complicated challenge for existing solutions, and it's where we really shine. We've also added some very interesting geospatial and machine learning capability into the database to help people understand and answer the questions that they need to today. We do this with significantly better economics than the existing solutions that are out there, both on-premises and in the cloud. Typically, we offer 10 to 100 times better price performance than those solutions. Speaking of solutions, that's where we're really focused. We have uh, a large number of big data architects on staff. We partner very closely with our customers to understand their data workflows. What data comes in? What do they truly need to analyze? What questions do they need to answer from their data? We will help design queries, design and optimize the database, all in an effort to deliver a functional uh, uh, production quality solution that can deliver business value faster for the customer. Speaking of solutions, once again, uh, we do focus very much on understanding individual use cases. And so this list here shows you some of the use cases that we've, uh, we've been able to work on and optimize for our end user customers. They span a variety of different industries uh, from ad tech to telecommunications, vehicle telematics and geospatial analysis, and even financial services. So for folks in the Department of Defense, they may look at this and, they, and say that it seems like uh, a variety of commercial use cases, but uh, we would argue that within you know, the defense and intelligence space, you will frequently see uh, use cases that span some of these different areas, right? So the learnings that we've uh, been able to do working with customers in these various spaces are gonna become relevant and valuable to defense customers uh, over time. I'd like to show you a little bit of uh, our view of the marketplace uh, of data analysis tools. So on the x-axis here, we've got you know, the size of data that is being actively analyzed. And then on the y-axis here, we have kind of 
a, an indicator of the scale of analysis, the number of CPU cores that are engaged in, in crunching on that data, right? So kind of, uh, you know, towards the, uh, towards the, the, uh, the bottom here, we've got the traditional symmetric multiprocessing databases. They've been around for a long time. Everybody knows them like SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, uh, relatively limited in scale. Uh, from there, we've got the online analytics processing platforms, right? Some of the older ones are the, uh, the on-prem massively parallel ones, Greenplum, Vertica, Teradata. And then you've got cloud uh, analytics processing platforms here as well, right? Very, very well known at this time. Um, particularly on the cloud side, these platforms are able to scale to very large quantities of data, but <clears throat> because of the way they work internally as the level, uh, the quantity of data that's being actively analyzed increases, more compute resources are being consumed, which, you know, essentially all of which you pay for as, as an end user customer. OSEANT kind of focuses on, you know, the, you know, 100 to 500 terabyte and beyond levels into exabyte you know, the quantities of information. Uh, our customers are typically doing very complex analysis and they're doing it almost all the time. So that's part of how we're able to do this uh, more affordably. We've come up with a solution which we call compute adjacent storage architecture that allows us to focus here. We think this is a very significant emerging market and that's why we've chosen to essentially go where others aren't right now. And we're doing that with geospatial capability and machine learning, which we will be talking about moving forward here. Here's an illustration of two different storage architectures. On the left-hand side, you see what we're referring to as remote object storage architecture, which is common in today's cloud data warehouses. And on the right-hand side, you'll see OSEANT's compute adjacent storage architecture. So looking at the remote object storage architecture for a moment, I'd like to point out a couple of features, right? So when you load your data into one of these uh, you know, uh, data analytics platforms, that data goes into you know a cloud object store right and it ultimately gets stored on spinning disk spinning disks have pretty well known performance characteristics each one is only capable of about 500 random reads per second and then that cloud you know uh, when data needs to be analyzed it gets pulled from this object storage cloud and then uh, pulled into a compute instance that gets instantiated when the analysis begins and you know you've got about a hundred gigabit network there and you know so and you've got a small cache uh on that compute instance and you know about 96 gigabits per second worth of bandwidth connecting those two if you need to analyze a larger set of data more compute instances will get pulled uh, will get instantiated or if you have more concurrency the same thing will happen but you're always traversing this 100 gigabit link and dealing with whatever latencies exist there this kind of is a model where you could say we're bringing the data to the compute, if you will. It becomes very, very expensive and not very fast when you're dealing at hyperscale. Think the trillions, quadrillions of rows that we were discussing before. With OSEANT, we've built our entire data warehouse from the ground up in C++ for maximum performance. We're trying to remove every source of latency from the code. We're optimizing for uh, today's modern hardware Think PCI Express Gen 5 architecture. Think you know NVMe solid state uh, flash as well. So we have within a, a standard x86 server today an unbelievable amount of internal bandwidth that we can take advantage of. And we do this by moving the compute operations as close to the data as possible. That's the source of compute adjacent storage architecture, right? So we take a standard you know, x86 server with a lot of NVMe, and then we move the compute as close as possible to that so that we can take advantage of this incredible bandwidth, right? So 100 gigabits versus almost you know, 6.7 gigabit, uh, you know, 6.7 terabits, if you will, millions of random reads per second that uh, a modern NVMe uh, flash device can provide you. We're talking hundreds to thousands of times more performance, and that's what results in queries that run 10, 50, 100 times faster than some of the cloud data warehouses that are out there today. And because of our pricing model, we can deliver this at up to 80% lower cost as well. Here's an example OSEANT system. And what you'll see here is we've got different classes of devices. We refer to this model as being a cluster of clusters, if you will. Each element has its own purpose, right? So in blue here, we've got what we call our loader cluster. This is built of, uh, of individual servers that handle the extract, transform, and load process. They take data in its existing you know, open format, 
Uh, they can accept data from either, you know, uh, batch mode from files or via stream loading from Apache Kafka. And they, they will extract the data, load it into our column store format, and then push it down to what we call the foundation cluster. The foundation cluster is where the data is ultimately stored, and it's where most of the computation against that data takes place. Lastly, we've got what we call the SQL cluster. This represents the front end of the data warehouse. So the SQL cluster will receive SQL commands either from you know, ad hoc uh, you know, queries that are being executed or business intelligence applications, maybe something like Jupyter Notebooks, something like that. And what they do, they receive the query, they put together an execution plan for how the query is going to be carried out, and then they push the instructions of that query down to the foundation cluster. We get an incredible amount of parallelism here to the point where we can engage every node in the foundation cluster on a single query, especially if it's a complex query. So we can deliver incredible performance that way. Here are some, you know, again, this is just a sample cluster. It's not built for any particular workload, but it gives one a sense of how this can be carried out. And this can be done, by the way, on premises on commodity standard x86 hardware, as long as it matches, you know, our, you know, memory and NVMe storage requirements. We can also do this in the cloud of your choice. So that's something important to bear in mind as well. OSEANT is an end-to-end -end solution. Because we're inclusive of the ETL process, that uh, also helps to reduce complexity. We understand uh, most open data formats, CSV, JSON, Apache, ORC, Avro, Parquet as examples. We also understand some network security formats like IPFIX and NetFlow data, which we can store. We can ingest this data, as I said, either through batch loading we can uh, batch load from S3, uh, Hadoop file system or NFS, and we can stream load through Kafka. And then we have a variety of different interfaces. First of all, we speak a standard Postgres SQL dialect. Uh, we support AD, ODBC and JDBC connectivity. We also have a Python driver and a Spark driver. And we've integrated to date with many visualization tools. Here's a list of the ones that we have uh, worked with so far. Now, now that you know what OSEAN is, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the things that we can do with OSEAN, right? So I wanna start with open source intelligence because this is a topic that comes up quite a bit with some of our DOD and Intel community customers. Um, you know, it's, it's becoming very common for people to want to, you know, enrich the bespoke sources of intelligence that they've generated through their operations with things that are, you know, commonly available. And you know, yes, this will increase you know the complexity of the uh, of the operation, leads to more data being stored overall. But you can answer very very interesting questions this way, right? For instance, if you can tap into you know uh, the things like uh, what what the weather conditions look like across the world, right? You can maybe take a look at where there have been you know consecutive days of flooding or consecutive days of drought, and that can start putting some pressure on you know uh, local governments, those sorts of things. If you combine that with social media feeds as well, you can start to you know, anticipate what might be the beginnings of some civil unrest. Um, so very, very interesting uh, you know, uh, information and, uh, can be gathered that way, and some interesting conclusions can be drawn from looking at that data as well. One capability that we've talked about a little bit is machine learning, right? So we are uh, fairly unique in that we can do machine learning operations within the database at petabyte and beyond scale, all right? So this is very, very powerful. Uh, we support a number of different models so far, some regression models, classification models, clustering and dimensionality reduction models. Uh, but essentially what you can do is you can create and deploy a machine learning model, you know, essentially using SQL dialect, right? You just, you know, create a machine learning model and then use a select statement to basically pick your, your different uh, um, you know, uh, data points that you want to analyze. And then you can call it as a scalar function after the fact. It's very, very simple to do. Where this really becomes powerful is you can do this and train the model and refine it on multiple petabytes of data without having to move the data outside of the warehouse. So you're taking advantage of that compute adjacent storage architecture, which was built to maximize the performance of a modern server. And you don't have the added complexity of having to pull the data out to another you know, device or another enclave in order to analyze it. This means you can iterate over the model much more rapidly. In the future, we will actually be able to incorporate the machine learning model into the ingest process. So you will be able to score incoming data against your trained model 
at the point of ingest, removing yet another uh, another workflow step that typically people work work through. So we're very excited about this capability. I also want to talk about something that we did in the real world. This was something that we did overseas, <clears throat> uh, but uh, we were essentially brought in by a telco that uh, re was required to share its information with law enforcement uh, organizations. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to, you know, log IP fix data off of their, you know, uh, TCP IP network. And they wanted to monitor it and see, you know, who was going where. And they had a couple websites that they suspected of being frequented by people with bad intentions, um, you know, essentially doing child trafficking. So whenever there would be a hit against one of those databases, that person became a person of interest. We wanted to log that device. We wanted to see where it went, you know, geospatially. And uh, the existing solution that they had to do this took somewhere between hours and days to respond to requests from law enforcement, right? So not very helpful when you're trying to track down bad people in real time. We were able to step in there and give them the answers to these complex queries in seconds where they previously had been waiting, as I said, hours or even days. Not only that, but we also enabled them to double their storage capacity to 12 months, right? Which gave them even further look back capability. And you know, the net result of this proof of concept was that they were actually able to take down a child trafficking ring in this country. So it was a really, really nice validation point. And just to sh share with you some of the metrics of this deployment, uh, over 39 sites, we uh, ingested a peak of about 18 and a half terabits per second of information. 3.1 million flows per second is what that, what that uh, correlates to. Uh, on average, it was 40 terabytes of data per day and you know, over a 12 month retention that worked out to be about 15 petabytes. So you know, this is combining IP fix data with geospatial data at very large scale to have a real world impact. I also wanna talk about a demo that we recently did for an auto company and it was oriented around vehicle telematics. Uh, you might not think that that's really relevant in the DOD space, but I think it is, right? Because fundamentally, the challenge here is an Internet of Things kind of challenge, right? So today's connected vehicles are capable of producing up to 30 terabytes of data per day because they can output data on hundreds of different metrics once a second. So in the civilian world, some of the use cases for this data include things like improving road safety, identifying problematic intersections where maybe we need to add a stop sign or a traffic signal, something like that. Route optimization for GPS you know, navigation location-based services and advertising, right? Maintenance analytics, you know, what's failing and why? Uh, predictive failure notifications, note, letting the, co the consumer know, hey, you know, you need maintenance on your vehicle, please get it fixed. So at, on, the, on the surface, this seems like purely a civilian challenge, but this is interesting information that has applicability on the battlefield, right? So, you know, let's say we're able to tap into the, to the, uh, the local telco provider. Is there a correlation between cell phone or social media traffic with a given geography and potentially, you know, an attack against, uh, you know, U.S. forces? Can we route around those hotspots, right? What about uh, logistics, critical parts? Are they lasting as long as they should uh, or are they failing prematurely? Uh, what's the stocking level that we need to support operations in a given part of the world? Can we warn deployed forces when something may be nearing failure, right? And then you almost have the ability to do like a battlefield DVR, if you will, right? You can kind of replay the events that happened in the battlefield after the fact, finding out who was where and when, and learn all kinds of interesting lessons from that. Should we have zigged when we zagged, things like that. So in the real world, you know, as DOD is pushing towards this concept of JADC2, the battlefield of the future is increasingly going to look like a connected car demo. Every element of the battlefield is, is generating data, and most of them are consuming data as well, right? So this makes for an interesting data-centric challenge. Uh, it, the data is going to be used in a couple different ways. The first is connecting sensors to shooters, right? So, you know, you need an absolutely uh, the smallest possible time to result because somebody in the battlefield is making a life or death decision based on you know receiving the right data at the right time. At the same time, all this data has historical value because it can be looked at you know after action reports. Uh, you know that's where a lot of your logistical learnings will come from, refining tactics, things like that. So 
what this ultimately means is that you know the the defense department needs a solution that can handle trillions or maybe even quadrillions of data points you know and analyze them in the shortest possible amount of time but also store enough of it economically to really unlock the value inherent in the data and we think that this kind of uniquely points towards you know something that OCEAN does very very well so in summary OSEAN can add value in any number of different ways. For starters, we, we unlock limitless scale for the customer, right? No longer do you have to worry about segmenting or siloing your operations because you can only handle so much scale at a given time, right? You can combine everything into one uh, data warehouse and analyze it quickly and effectively there. The solution is inclusive of transformation and loading, offering greater simplicity. We allow you to consolidate multiple data silos through very, very high performance and, you know, again, the ability to support uh, added scale. We do this with a minimal storage footprint, leveraging technologies such as erasure coding and compression. We offer sophisticated workload management, allowing uh, for multi-tenant operations and quality of service. And our customer-focused solutions team allows people to accelerate time to market by really understanding the workflows uh, you know, that, uh, that need to be implemented. With that, I hope that you found this session on OSINT valuable, and we look forward to having a discussion with you and your mission requirements in the future.